origin of the field of classical studies in places virtuous and other places less so. And tonight we'll present a new set of what I'm subtitling as judgmental geographies uh, for a reimagined field. But first, some words on Joy herself. Joy earned a BA in classical studies from Princeton and a PhD from this great institution here. And she's held professorships at the University of Washington and Stanford University before moving to NYU, um, where she was not only a transformational classicist, but a transformational dean and advocate for the humanities. As provost and interim president at CUNY Graduate Center, uh, she helped reimagine what, and I'm looking at all the graduate students in the audience, what a graduate degree and a postgraduate future might actually look like, encouraging public facing dissertations and public facing post PhD careers. Joy's administrative career has thus been an insistent voice for the importance of intellectual work in the world. The ivory tower is less ivory and less towering thanks to Joy's efforts. Joy is also one of those rarities in American life, a true public intellectual. In Europe, where I have spent much of my time, public intellectuals are everywhere using their scholarly acumen to weigh in on the weighty issues of the day. There aren't enough public intellectuals, public sphere thinking in America, in my opinion, and Joy is one of those wonderful exceptions. Her own scholarly work has been on ancient Romans idea of public life, of public speech, and the responsibilities that both of those things carry. And she has carried those interrogations into our own public life and its responsibilities. Her writings have appeared in The Independent, The Village Voice, The Time Literary Supplement, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Nation. She works with contemporary artists. She champions the arts and the humanities in public fora around the world and generally finds connections between the ancient world and the modern one in literature and politics and music and in film. Joy's topic tonight are what I've shorthanded as the judgment geographies, past, present, and future, that have defined the classical world. In her last lecture, she had a good go, just beginning, I think, at what she calls Greece and Rome. It's one word. The Greece and Rome malady, I should say, the early modern tendency to frame classical studies around a set of bests, which are bounded by a set of largely arbitrary geographies, linguistic, political, and temporal, in the process cutting out whole cultures and languages, which were in fact actually integral and critical. She also expressed some skepticism, I'm really excited to hear more about the skepticism, with what we might call the add-on remedy, tacking on to Greece and Rome, uh, adjacent geographies like the Near East or North Africa, Sanskrit, uh, or ancient Hebrew, suggesting this doesn't actually solve the fundamental problem. What the fundamental problem really is, how to solve it, and just importantly, how we train ourselves to do not classical studies, Greece and Rome, but global ancient studies, her proposed new field, that's her topic for us today. And we can't wait to hear more about how this is going to take place. So. Joy Connolly, The Skills of World Making. Joy. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Kim, that was a terrific introduction. I wanna thank, move over a little bit, there we go. I wanna thank the Department of Classical Studies um, for hosting me and especially the graduate students for sharing so many of their thoughts and insights and questions with me. Uh, over the last couple of days and, and Friday as well. Um, I wanna thank uh, Peter Strzok for organizing this so well. Um, Peter as chair of the department and, and Sarah Gish Kraus for making everything smooth. Although I note even the best administrators can't solve every HR problem, but they are all now solved. So um, all, all is going well. And especially the Arate Foundation and, uh, and Jonathan and Ed Cohen who have made this new series possible. I'm hugely honored to be here and um, and speak to you as I gradually unfold, there will be even more on Thursday, uh, the promise of, of the talk as Kim laid it out. 
So in the first lecture, I argued that, that classical texts have a distinctive quality that I called publicness, which they possess thanks to how they've been selected for and how they've been put to use over time. And we see examples of this publicness, of course, all around us in the architecture of our state houses and our law courts, the imagery on our coins, and the names of gods and goddesses that are at once somehow alien, but also familiar. Departments of classical studies too advertise their teaching of topics and concepts often described as having been invented or having their origins in the ancient world. And these all have quotes around them. So having their origins in the, the ancient world. And I'm drawing attention to the way we use that article as though there's only one. Like justice and democracy, okay? These are important to study according to these websites because they make up the keystones of the public culture that's imagined to bind us all together. So what I was asking there, and I'm just doing a little recap to remind us of where we are, and for those of you who are new to kind of situate you in the discussion, I asked uh, on Thursday, who belongs in this public and who's been welcomed, who has always felt like they belonged and who has been given grudging admission and who still feels like they don't belong. And we might venture that ideally everybody belongs or at least everyone who wants to, but history tells us a different story. And liberal principles notwithstanding, the individual will to belong is not the only power at work in the world. It's not the determinative power typically at work in the world. The canon we read today, the scholarly practices out of which classical studies evolved were created during a period of history when, because Europeans dominated the globe technologically and economically, European knowledge, and we might say European fantasies, European hopes, were all established as the universal standard by which all other knowledge, aspirations, hopes, ideas would be judged. It was that development that powered the field of classical, what we now call classical studies at its birth. It continues that development to hover behind it, and we might say even to haunt it. But the global system that sustained European power and that justified the shape of the first modern universities has been changing from where we stand now for over half a century. So my aim last week was to call attention to the fact that the way we organize knowledge in classical studies and in the university more broadly too, because this is one piece of, of a larger picture, has not changed as the world has. And I really believe it must if we want to ask new questions and produce new knowledge, if we want to gain more accurate understanding of the world as it really was, that V.S. V.S. identic division of, of, uh, of, uh, of our fantasy, perhaps, if we want to advance justice and if we want to build a culture of care for the past in the true spirit of what I called amor mundi, the love of the whole world, not just one part of it. So I ended with two proposals I'm almost done my recap. First, I said, let's drop the label classical for good because it doesn't do us any favors in the world today and it's doing some damage. We can talk about more of that in the q and if you, if you are interested. And second, as Kim said, let us expand the boundaries of ancient studies past those adjacent regions of Egypt and the Near East and work collaboratively with scholars of antiquity on a global scale. And today I'm gonna to argue, I will hope to convince you by the end of today that uh, I won't just do this, but this will be the first part, that the continuing pull of what I call Greece and Rome, one word, is just too strong for us to rest with this incremental redefinition of the field. Like any solution involving change and pretty radical change, the one I'm proposing would involve risk. That's no question about that. And to some, it would feel like loss. To others, it would feel like gain. I wanna forget that part of the equation. It's just as, in fact, even more important. But it would allow us, I think, to pursue studies that more accurately reflect the flow of knowledge and ideas and people across oceans and across land masses. It would allow us, in a sense, to re-politicize the human sciences, not in the sense of observing current interests or trying to figure out answers to any particular local problem, but to distribute academic resources, both in the, the coin of scholarly attention and in the coin of funding, in ways that reflect our interconnected global life. I mean, life really as it really is. But my years of academic administration have taught me many things, but one thing that scholars are exceptionally sharp critical thinkers. And that means that they're quick to see negatives to any proposal, probably quicker than to see positives. 
So let me try to jump out of in, front, uh, in front of at least one, one objection. You know, some might say that in recent years, the academy has finally begun to remedy the centuries long exclusion of women, of people from outside Europe, of people forcibly enrolled in the European world project. And that we're now finally critically examining what we center and value and what we don't value. And we're gradually recalibrating our value system for the better. And I think some people would say it's happening far too slowly. Other people would say it's happening at just the pace we can expect. And other people are probably saying it's happening awfully fast. Now, all of this is true, this work of recalibration. And to ignore it, this development, this important development and, and recalibration would be to disrespect the efforts of those doing the work. But I'm holding in mind thinkers like the people you see on the screen, thinkers like Roderick Ferguson, Candace Chu, Depeche Chakrabarty, and especially Sylvia Winter, eminent scholar of Spanish, theorist of knowledge systems, and the first black woman to receive tenure at Stanford. These scholars call on us to think and write about human experience in modes that displace the familiar orientation of human experience around Europe and North America. There is no order in the world that can exist or hold together without a founding story, Winter says. She's here on your screen. Now, the question, I'm still quoting Winter, now the question for academia in the 21st century is, will you make space within it to be able to write a new foundation? So today, taking a close look at a pivotal stage in the foundation of classical studies in the 19th century, I'm gonna identify two related and I think just intractable epistemological weaknesses in the field. I mean, weaknesses in the way we have come to think about how we think about Greece and Rome. I also want to identify several generative strengths of the 19th century approach that can help us map constructive future directions. Both weaknesses and strengths are bound up with the concept of the classical world, Greece and Rome, as it was defined at that time. So that is where I'll begin with the classical world. I mean, the phrase is, is so familiar uh, by now and these days that it's difficult, at least I find it difficult to think critically about it. But it's worth reminding ourselves that it's relatively recent as a label. The notion of a coherent classical world, meaning Greek and Roman society and culture from roughly the eighth century BCE, the period associated with Homeric epic to the fourth or fifth century CE, depending on how you date the decline of the Roman empire, assumed its current meaning in late 18th century Germany. At that time, scholars working in the first iteration of the modern research university created what they called Altertumswissenschaft, the science or scholarship of antiquity. Along with it, they built all the apparatus of institutionalization. And, and I just want you to remind you of the date here, you know, late 18th century, but it starts getting built up then. University departments and department names, scholarly journals, conferences, and of course, um, dearest to my heart, given my current job, learned societies. Institutionalization meant division and specialization and poor Wilhelm von Humboldt is a little difficult to see in the sun, but that's who you are looking at right now. In the early 1800s in Berlin, von Humboldt saw that increased access to travel and the means to publish meant that vast amounts of knowledge were entering circulation at a scale and pace unprecedented in human history. And he designed his university to tame and direct that flood. And the story of this is brilliantly told by Chad Wellman in his Organizing Enlightenment book, if you want to read further about this, about this history. And his was the model that was imitated with particular enthusiasm by research universities in the United States. Once Humboldt had established, as he did, the scope of his university as the whole planet, the disciplines that emerged to fill it reflected the intellectual and political priorities of his European male contemporaries, a pattern understandable at the time, but maybe not so understandable now, still stamps American universities today. The Greeks were central to the German project from the start. Humboldtian students were charged with gaining knowledge through a particular disciplinary or aerial perspective for the purpose of living a well-informed life as a self and as a citizen of the state and of the world. So three levels there as a person, local citizen, world citizen. And given, given that end, Humboldt wrote in 1793, Greek culture and particularly Athenian culture represents, and I quote, a remarkable phenomenon, one possibly unique in history, 
Even in their earliest poems and artifacts, he went on to say the Athenians showed, and I'll quote again, an extraordinary responsiveness to beauty and nature and art, a finely cultivated tact and a right taste, not for criticism, but for feeling." End quote. And as they evolved, and now I'm summarizing, he says, they managed to evade the decadence that affects other cultures. This made Greek material the best with which to educate the whole student in his private life and his public life, according to Humboldt. But in that same 1793 essay, Humboldt also acknowledged the tension between attention to the whole culture and the specialized pieces of expert knowledge that composed that whole. Piece by hard won piece, that knowledge was being produced in the other new invention of 18th century German scholarly culture, the specialized disciplinary seminar whose goal was training students to work away at discrete pieces of the human sciences. Its adherents bitterly attacked Humboldt's whole student school for its lack of rigor. But the seminar had its own problems. One of its original designers, Friedrich August Wolff, well known to classicists for his 1795 prolegomena to Homer, worried from the very beginning about the seminar's narrow vision. As early as 1806, he was complaining that his students in Halle were concentrating on what he called inconsequential antiquarian detail. 15 years later in Berlin, another champion of the seminar, August Böck, lamented that most philologists were doing their work without thinking. <laughs> and I quote, everything is dismembered in their hands, he wrote. They possess neither a concept of the extent nor an intuition of the essence of philology, and they only know details among which their thought disintegrates. Now, this debate might, as we consider it from, from our distance, kind of banal. I mean, after all, we also worry about the same problem today. The big picture students who are impatient with pesky details the obsessive ones who skirt the big questions. But for these German scholars, the special status of the object of study totally changed the stakes. And they were studying the Greeks. And here is Wolf again. And I quote, as will become obvious, only in ancient Greece do we find what we look for in vain almost everywhere else. Peoples and states, which by virtue of their nature, possessed most of the qualities that laid the foundations for a character that is perfected to full humanity. In these and other respects of all the nations, none is as important, and I dare say, wholly for the student of human history as that of the Greeks, end quote. Here was a culture whose remarkable fullness, beauty, and unity, and this is a really important point, demanded imaginative creativity on the one hand and specialized empirical expertise in equal, and these scholars themselves acknowledge often it felt impossible measure. To understand the pull of the idea that Greek culture expressed the absolute best of the human spirit, we need to look backward in time, a half century before Humboldt established his university in Berlin and a generation before the first disciplinary seminar was held in Halle. The notion first gained popularity in Johann Winkelmann's 1764 History of the Art of Antiquity, Geschichte der Kunst der Altertums, des Altertums, excuse me. In that book, Winkelmann tied the evolution of Greek art to the unfolding of historical events, creating a totalizing representation of culture as the organic expression of the spirit of the people, in this case, the spirit of the Greeks. Now I should note here, uh, for those Romanists or people sympathetic to Roman studies in the room, that the Romans of course had their own legacy of architecture, art, and texts, but it was less attractive to Winkelmann for several reasons. It was secondary, it was imitative, it was more imperial, more commercial, more Christian, more connected to the present day. Rome did win a place in his antiquity, largely because the Romans were the first dedicated fans of Greek culture. And this along with its extensive material remains and the fact of Latin's enduring role in Europe as a theological and philosophical common language well into the 19th century, this ensured uh, its enshrining in what was becoming slowly or really would become in the early years of the 19th century, professional classical scholarship. We might even say, although no doubt they would detest this, this, that the new German scientists of antiquity were making themselves into what they imagined Romans to have been, belated imitators and scholars of the Greeks. In his history of ancient art, Winkelmann also modeled a totalizing approach to scholarship by which scholars would engage, engage in the immersive 
imaginative reconstruction of ancient Greece and Rome. As Goethe said in an essay about Winkelmann that itself became a touchstone in German culture and not just German academic culture, and I quote, one does not learn anything from Winkelmann, but we become something when we read him. Goethe means that in contact with Winkelmann and through his fulsome imagination in contact with the Greeks, this makes us something other than and better than ourselves. Well, even as they endlessly debated his contribution, scholars were quick to follow Winkelmann's lead, both his focus on Greece and Rome as the preserver of Greek culture and his advocacy for scholarship that would disclose the spirit and the lived experience of the ancient peoples. So as they narrowed their focus on the cultural production of Greece and Rome, they simultaneously expanded the material studied to include history, literature, art, architecture, religion, philosophy, science, and material culture. Textual criticism and restoration was transformed or really uh, made a part of and embedded in Altertum's Wissenschaft, an interpretive philology aiming to capture the totality of Greek and Roman experience. Only the harmonious fusion of all elements of the science of antiquity can bring forth true philology, one professor wrote in 1808, because only the comprehensive appreciation and understanding of antiquity reveals the spirit, the geist of the classical world. This interdisciplinary approach, of course, seems very familiar to us now, but at the time it was new and almost crazily ambitious. It wasn't an obvious move. It certainly represents a turn away from the approach of earlier Italian and German humanists, where the new scientists of antiquity sought access to the total network of cultural, political, and social formations that could be studied only by a correspondingly unified scholarly methodology. The earlier humanists had focused on the interpretation of words, of grammar, and style. And they were absolutely interested in history, but typically, uh, but the focus of the leading, of leading work was on language. The humanists of the 16th and 17th century, whom I talked a little bit about last Thursday, I'm now lending some nuance to the picture, as you can see, had, had also tended to spread their linguistic and cultural nets more widely. They devoted the bulk of their energies to editing and, and interpreting Latin and Greek texts. There's no question about that. But they were interested and talked avidly about the study of Hebrew, Chaldean, or Aram Aramaic, and Egyptian. Pico della Mirandola's citation of Jewish and Egyptian knowledge and his oration on, in praise of humanity in 1486 is one especially powerful example of the expansive humanist vision that intellectual historians have been exploring in recent years. Perhaps the, perhaps the best example, and the book is behind me, if you can read it in the light, I have always loved the holy tongue. Uh, the best example is the late 16th and early 17th century scholar Isaac Kassauben, who, as Tony Grafton and Joanna Weinberg have shown in this book, considered Hebrew of equal value with Latin and Greek and was frustrated by his limited access to still other languages. And moving back to the early 19th century, we do find a few influential scholars who sought to perpetuate the humanist field of curiosity. The poet and translator Friedrich Schlegel, for, for instance, eloquently advocated for the study of Sanskrit in ancient India, although without much success, and he took some uh, good deal of public criticism for his advocacy for this study. Not coincidentally, I think Schlegel rejected the idea that one needed to study the full historical context of texts to understand them and to grasp their larger significance, rather than focusing on the evolution of particular traditions, strand by strand, which he saw tended to have a teleological bent that favored stories about European progress or triumph, he concentrated on seeking instead to identify and understand human essences and archetypes around the world. We can certainly look critically on his attempt to do that work, but he did see it as a, I think, more progressive um, alternative uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the tradition specific scholarship he saw all around him and the privileging of Europe. Generally though, and here's Wolf again on the left, the emergent classicists of Germany defined the study of ancient cultures as limited to Greece and Rome on the ground that other cultures were not worth studying. 
and lectures given many times to generations of students from 1785 to 1823, Wolf claimed that the ancient nations of Asia had left behind insufficient evidence for scholarship. And I quote, not a single people before and alongside the Greeks advanced to a learned or scientific culture. None of them preserved a body of literature, end quote. Wolf also contradicted himself and argued in circles when he said, if we wanna preserve a homogeneous whole in classics, we can only take the Greeks and the Romans. We must exclude the others. In the end, he rested his judgment on irreconcilable differences in language and custom between what he called Oriental nations and Greece and Rome, which he said, and I quote a final time, makes it impossible to find perspectives, perspectives that would allow us to unite both. Poets and philosophers tended to agree with Wolf and some had already helped clear the ground for him. In his ideas on the philosophy of the history of humanity, and I have to admit, I love the title of these 18th century works. Uh, this was completed in 1791. Um, Herder praised the Greeks for keeping, and I quote, free from admixture with alien nations. He remarked that the inland nations were either stalled at the earliest beginnings of culture or succumbed to conquest before they could mature. The aesthetic of a Greek and Roman, Roman antiquity conceived of as a whole, a world closed unto itself, and these are both phrases that Wolf uses, was translated by August Book, whom I mentioned at the beginning, into his seminar's institutional practice. And this had special consequences for scholars in the United States who attended German seminars in increasing numbers starting right at this time and through the 19th century. The philology of classical antiquity is a natural unit, Burke wrote, because the classical is eminently worth knowing, and the culture of the Greeks and Romans is the foundation of our entire self-formation, our building. This is the powerful uh, and still potent construct that I'm calling Greece and Rome. Its content Context is the emergent romantic concept of the nation, itself a tangle of beliefs about ethnicity, language, and transhistorical cultural identity or spirit. Mix this with the tension at the time between Europe and the Islamic Ottoman Empire, exacerbated by the early 19th century Greek call on fellow Christian inheritors of the Greek tradition to support their fight for independence. Add the longing for, or we might say fantasy of, total understanding of an entity defined as a world, the ancient world, so long as we learn the languages well enough, so long as we clarify the order of historical events accurately enough. We can see how Greece and Rome becomes a prototypical nation before nations and a common quasi-ethnic origin story for 19th century imperialist Western Europe. More than an origin story though, the arc of the Greeks' perfection of human culture and tragic loss and collapse is a secular version of the fall in Genesis. Remember what else was going on in late 18th and early 19th century Germany. This is where the modern literary genres of fairy tale and folk tale and fantasy first appear in the writings of masters of the imagine, imagination like E.T.A. Hoffman and Novalis. Now the movement is generally interpreted and, and has been for a long time in scholarship as a nativist reaction, a desire to construct a Germanic Volk literature that could compete with Greece and Rome but invert the picture and we can see how the desires that fed popular love of fairy tale and fantasy also shaped the scholarly imagination. Greece and Rome emerges in this view as a German and particularly Prussian romantic investment in a form of knowledge in, with, in which both creative imagination, which Winkelmann had said was so crucial in understanding and, and identifying with the ancient world and a tragic sense of distance and loss played a considerable part. This is how, by the way, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, himself not a classicist uh, in, in his ultimate mature focus as a scholar, but someone who worked on Anglo-Saxon poetry, a kind of um, partner field in, in his world at Oxford. And this is how Tolkien describes the seductive pull of the fantasy genre, surveying a past that is, as he said, pagan, but noble and fraught with deep significance and rife with extremes, and this is me, it lets us indulge ourselves, he says, in a past that is, more, that is darker and more desperate and yet filled with opportunities for excellence and virtue. 
In our modern language and literature departments, the organizing principle is that the acquisition of knowledge is conducted within the context of nations when they're European and regions when they're not. So we have German, French, and Francophone studies, but we have African studies, Asian studies, and so on. Now, Greece and Rome is not, of course, a nation, but a construct, but it grounds identitarian impulses by transcending them. On hearing the name Greece, Hegel remarks, a cultured European man immediately feels himself to be in his home country. Emergent classical studies then indulged a comforting European fantasy of belonging any place a person meets others who shares his education. Of course, this also, what Hegel said, fueled fantasies of Germanic superiority and I don't normally put a lot of text on the slide, but this is kind of difficult just to read. Um, and I thought it would be worth you hearing it and reading it at the same time. A student of Heine, another early founder of the seminar, Friedrich Jacobs explained in 1807, with renewed love, we returned to antiquity. The holy fire had not yet been extinguished under the overturned altars. The columns of its temple still stood fast. Antiquity's magnificence, magnificence was worshipped with greater passion than ever before. Under the pressure of hostile conditions, the strength of the German people in its striving for the noblest goals has gloriously prevailed. The great events of our time have brought us closer to antiquity. He's obviously thinking of the Napoleonic Wars. Its authors are more avidly read and better understood, and there is hardly any part of the wide field of the classical world that has not been illuminated by new and consequential research. Now, Jakob's ecstasy is troubling, especially with 20th century hindsight, um, but is it really alien to us entirely? Studies of Greece and Rome continue to have passionate fans today inside and outside the academy. Constanza Gutenka, in her excellent study of the German philologist's passionate attachment to Greece, is so wary of this de degree of investment that in the coda to her volume, she ends up calling on scholars today to cultivate kind of safe detachment. <laughs> but here we can pause to take stock and, and draw some important distinctions. Greece and Rome was constructed through a series of systematic judgments of taste, beliefs in racial and ethnic superiority and political expediency. It cut other cultures out of the picture. It belittled actual historical trans-regional connections of trade, migration, cultural exchange, and war. It cultivated an overdetermined approach to tradition that hopelessly blurred European technological and economic dominance with the possession and the development of political ideas such as liberty and democracy. And I hope we can talk about that blurring in the question and answer to period. It encouraged misleading stories of Greek and Roman exceptionalism and dimmed the lights on investigations of collective governance or lyric poetry or the human form in sculpture anywhere else. Despite the putative embrace by the scientists of antiquity of the totality of Greek and Roman culture, Christian and Jewish texts composed in the Roman Empire, or the Greek for that matter, were always treated differently from pagan ones. Attempts like Schlegel's to encourage comparative studies with other ancient cultures were not, not entirely shut down, but they never won over the core. And when I say never, I'm talking about now, not just then. The insistence that philology was dedicated in the first instance to studying the classical, a gloss for the best or the most important, led to the marginalization or exclusion of the study of other languages, ultimately playing a part in what the Sanskritist act of today, Sheldon Pollock calls the dismemberment of philology and the resulting lunar landscape, that's his phrase, of fragmented language and literature departments. So these are the limitations and the consequences that we live with from this construct of Greece and Rome, not just its equation of these regions with the classical and thus the best and the most worthy of study. But what I really want to emphasize is its erasure of entire areas and flows of knowledge and goods and people. This is the undergirding of a vision of the ancient world as the origin of the West, right? The West. Talk about a new idea. It is only about 100 years old, but the ardent way people talk about defending it, it's as though they think it's rooted in antiquity. The idea of Greece and Rome is the main reason that mistake is so easy to make. But the desire for encounters with an unfamiliar world, 
the quest to build that world in the imagination so fully and richly that empathy and shared taste emerge, the desire to preserve and understand the artifacts of the past and through close study of them to transport oneself into another place and moment. Well, here with all these things, the German scientists of antiquity were onto something. And these I think are the generative strengths of their practice. Hannah Arendt once wrote, and I quote, if someone wants to see and experience the world as it really is, he can do so only by understanding it as something that's shared by many people, lies between them, separates and links them, showing itself differently to each and comprehensible only to the extent that many people talk about it and exchange their opinions and perspectives with one another over and against one another. Arendt was talking about world-making, the creation of a shared world of thinking and common purpose, the place where exchanges key to democratic politics can happen and where our individuality as human beings is made visible and our individual value as human beings is thus preserved. She saw the purpose of the university as enabling world-making because it convenes people around the activity of talking together about texts, about ideas, about works of art. To recover and protect our world today, Arendt thought, we need what she called worldly thinking. She rejected the purely abstract introspection and speculation that later in her career she saw embodied in the work of her old teacher, Heidegger. Rather than lose ourselves in abstraction, we need to understand the world we share in common with one another so that we can build a common mesh of plural perspectives and viewpoints. So Arendt enjoined educators to teach and I think this is, I was talking a little bit about this phrase last night uh, in my talk with some humanities faculty. I mean, it's so important for us, I think, to hear these words right now that she enjoined educators to teach not how to live the good life, not morals, not belief systems, not what to think, but what the world is like, to use her phrase, and how to talk about it with one another. This education, she thought, would make students world builders in love with the world, in her phrase committed to repairing and renewing it. This is the strength of the German philologist's ambition when it came to the scope of their study. The historian Tony Grafton has said that to men like them, everything ancient was alien to them and had to be understood in all its rich otherness. By building a world, understanding how it fits together, finding something in it that is like or unlike themselves, they stretch their imaginations to try to encompass alien experience to possess and make familiar that experiment, that experience, but also to experiment with it. Now, neither Arendt nor the German scientists of antiquity defined the world ancient or modern as we would today. Their voluntary attachment to their construct of antiquity is nonetheless generative in an optimistic sense, as Lauren Berlant would say when she writes about optimism as, and I quote, the force that moves you out of yourself and into the world end quote, in order to satisfy something you cannot generate on your own, but you sense in another person, another way of life, an object or a concept. So their activity, I think, is reminiscent of Romans like Cicero, who studied Athenian culture hundreds of years in, the, in, in, in his past with the pleasure of experiencing the creativity and worldview of others. But it's probably not a coincidence that one of the most high profile developments in classical studies today, and one practitioner, Jim Porter says it's booming, <laughs> involves studying imaginative engagements with the Greek and Roman texts. I'm speaking of course, of what we call reception studies, the study of how Greek and Roman texts are received and transformed in various ways at different times around the world. The approach is based on the belief that ancient and modern provide mutual illumination of each other. And that's a phrase of Charles Martindale, one of the founding scholars of this approach. And over the last 30 or 40 years, the movement has taken on considerable prominence in classical studies as the basis for a new hermeneutics and a new vision of the field and its future. We've seen new courses, new requirements, and even new journals devoted to it. One of its most foremost scholars, Emily Greenwood, who I think is coming to see you in the fall, praises the study of the dissemination and free circulation of classical influences in parts of the world beyond Europe, which she says demonstrates the potential for Greek and Roman texts and myths to cut across national and cultural formations. She argues that reception studies offers fresh ways of thinking about the cultural mobility of the classics without appealing to discredited old fashioned notions of timeless importance or universal value. 
Bonnie Honig is one of many reception scholars who study how works like Sophocles' Antigone prompt the contemporary reader to see familiar political concepts in new light. Hannah Arendt can be seen as a scholar of reception. Um, I can be too. The origins of this approach lie in the deep past in the study of the reception of Greek texts by ancient Roman authors and by Greek and Roman authors together of what has gone before them, a dynamic tradition explored by Jim Porter's collection on classical pasts. The creativity and sheer excitement resulting from expanding this field of exchange uh, to this scale is encouraging. In radically changing the temporal and spatial boundaries of the Greek and Roman past, though, it also raises, to me, really serious questions. Reception studies is a political as well as intellectual move because its determinations of time and space arise from judgments often unspoken about what forces and events really matter how we understand progress and how we look to the future. In one of the most famous lines of Virgil's Aeneid, Jupiter promises Venus that he will give her son Aeneas and his Roman descendants imperium sine fine, empire without end. So my question for us to think about as we think about futures and think about the contrast between the habits of German philologists and reception studies scholars is, where is the phoenix, the end or boundary of the new imperium of reception studies? If we don't theorize its borders and its methods more carefully, we risk recentering Greece and Rome as well as our own expertise. We risk, I think, claiming that we're in a position to build the whole world because of our expert knowledge of Greece and Rome. I'm reminded here of the American physician and signer of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Rush, who complained to a letter, uh, in a letter to John Adams in 1810, the fate of Rome has been peculiar with respect to her empire. She once governed the world by her arms, afterward by her religion, and she now governs the most civilized part of it by her language. Her empire is no less unjust in the last than in the two former instances. Rush liked to say, Latina lingua delenda est. To understand Derek Walcott's epic poem, Omaras, as a work of classical reception, should we not study Caribbean history, politics, and art as thoroughly as we study Homeric Greek? What does it tell us about our intellectual and cultural priorities if we decide we need the Greek, but not the Caribbean? And what links us as a, as a field if we choose the Caribbean? Now, I'm not suggesting we stop doing reception studies, I'm not, nothing along those lines. I'm, as I said, I identified myself as someone who has done a bit of it. But before it becomes our default future as a field, and I see this as one very plausible future, I think uh, we should examine, by contrast to it, one more generative strength of German Altertumswissenschaft, its focus on preserving and understanding primary evidence, linguistic, material, and artistic. And when we stop to think about it, the real question I'm asking here, and I think I suspect a question we ask among ourselves um, just about maybe not every day, that would be a little worrying, but regularly, you know, why do we seek to understand the past in its particularity? And one way to answer that question, and there are many answers to it, is to look more closely at the whole experience of encountering something by definition, just distant temporally from ourselves. Studying distant material is an intellectual activity for sure, and it has its own pleasures and satisfactions on that purely intellectual level. But it's also an opportunity for us to reflect on the encounter with something new and unfamiliar, the other, to use the word that the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas helped make popular um, about 75 years ago. Levinas believed that to engage in thinking with another or about another opened the way to recognize one's dependence on others. And we can apply Levinas's insight to the relationship between the reader and the ancient texts. These distant texts demand us to develop the habit of slow and careful reading if we wish to engage with them, if we wish to contemplate them in the relationship of otherness with us. Only that habit lets us understand, let alone do justice to the text. This kind of reading, and I think only this kind of reading, permits us as readers to embrace the text, as one Levinasian literary critic likes to say, and that's Derek Attridge. Reading in the original languages is an event that allows us to recreate and take pleasure in the force of the creator, writer's creative invention, even as reading displaces us out of our own moment, thus allowing us 
to, re to expand our horizons of experience and knowledge, to learn. And this demands attention to the text in its particularity, the more so, the more distant it is from us. So I'm not suggesting here that we sustain the traditional gatekeeping role of the study of Latin and Greek at the center of my new ancient studies, but I do think the preservation of linguistic knowledge is a humanistic priority and one that any version of ancient studies needs to make a lot of room for. And this is where I'm gonna begin my lecture on Thursday. But I'm not quite finished yet. Knowledge doesn't exist in a bubble. It exists in and through external forces, social, political, culture, and cultural, and economic. Back in the German University of the late 18th century, as various designs for the disciplines were debated, scholars were also asking what, if anything, scholars owe to the public. Johann Gottlieb Fichte tackled this question as a young professor at Jena in his lectures concerning the scholar's vocation. What is the scholar's place in the scheme of things, he asked. What relation do scholars have to each other and to other men in general, especially various classes of men? Well, O is a very strong word, but I follow Fichte in asking the question, and I propose we answer it by reflecting critically on both the content of our scholarship and the, relations, the relationships we foster in pursuing it. To what end do we work? For whose benefit? Who is our audience? And with whom are we doing our scholarship? We have choices, I think, right now. We can argue that we can preserve most of the old structure and curriculum of classical studies freed from the burden of its old history. And you can imagine what I think about the power of our ability to think ourselves out of that burden. We can say that we are just one tradition among many studied in the university and that staying the course you know, doesn't really do anyone any harm, kind of passive approach. We can underscore the liberatory elements of the classical tradition and its continued revitaliz revitalization today, for example, by studying black classicists who fought for a place in the field or the reception of Greek and Roman texts in the global south or the ways classical texts have prompted resistant or reformist or even revolutionary thinking from Machiavelli to Margaret Fuller to W.E.B. Du Bois. Alternatively, though I see this one as the least effective and as well as the least adventurous response, and it's not one I would pursue. Some may double down and insist that the wisdom of Greece and Rome is indeed more valuable than the wisdom of other traditions, or at least that it's most relevant for Americans because we're the kind of quasi-biological heirs of the European tradition. But if Greek and Roman texts are worth teaching because they pose the big questions about life, how we live and flourish together, the nature of virtue and justice, the impact of literary art, and this is just to name a few, we could also retain Greece and Rome and build up around it a scholarly field based really primarily on critique, where we examine the ancient text's answers in order to show how limited they are. There's some satisfaction in that, and this work certainly needs doing to a certain extent, but it leaves, I think, too many directions unexplored. More adventurous and more promising is to create collaborations that open up those big questions on a global scale. So far, the great books of the classical tradition have been unable to unsettle the march of the market economy and its oppressions, but partnering with other traditions might help us do the work of that unsettling more effectively. I believe we can and we should think on this bigger scale. The Afrofuturist and organizer Janaya Khan has remarked, we have to be really creative and we have to find joy in each other. As much as it might be easy to think that all we talk about is revolution, we also talk about joy and the type of world we're creating because we understand that revolution isn't just the end of something, it's the beginning of something, something new, something that has a larger table, that has more people at it, something that feels more collaborative. Now, it is impossible to imagine, I think, for us what the new global field will be and feel like. We may find ourselves in a kind of new Tower of Babel, in a state of confusion and cacophony. But my strong sense, perhaps, perhaps optimistic, given my own character and privilege, is that this bold move would aid us in the formidable task of living together under conditions of increasing hatred and fear. My proposal is a bet on the humanity of humanistic studies and on the awareness in most of us that human collective life is facing conditions of emergency and that we have the capacity to extend mutual 
comprehension among human beings across traditions. Now this comprehension will always thin out as we move outward from the core and away and across. But despite that inevitable process, collaborating with others, studying ancient pasts is the most promising path by which we can continue to stage our own deeply textured encounters with the other, to cultivate our imagination and empathy and preserve the original material and our ability to interpret it, all great and humanistic and human goods. So today I sought to articulate care, techniques of care or, or techniques yet, sorry, that's for Thursday, um, attitudes of care for the past that I think amount to a humanistic ethic, though not just for Greece and Rome, however rich and interesting that construct is, our care for the past should embrace many antiquities. The ancient world, that phrase we usually use now to refer exclusively to the ancient Mediterranean, maybe its neighbor, the ancient Near East, should really encompass the planet at different points in time. We all stand invited to assist in this work, which is, and I believe should be, inspired by care for others, living and dead and not yet alive. Thank you very much. Joy, thank you so much. Optimism is contagious. I feel more optimistic every time I listen to you. Um, before I ask, I'm gonna ask you all to think of your questions and muster your questions. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to do that and claim the first question for myself if I could. Um, I have many, many questions. Um, I think I'd like to ask you though, first, you had many interesting and difficult things to say about what our relationship is with the past. And you gave some examples of um, Germans gone wrong in their attitude to the past. In, in a way, uh, and you gave last time some extraordinary examples of a Renaissance idea, essentially is if you get Latin right, you can make the world better. This kind of utopian engagement with the classics. You talked about an emotional engagement with the classics. These Germans who actually somehow thought that they, as Germans who were actually never part of the Greek world, were actually able to re-inhabit it in some way. Um, and you and you and you cited a whole series of people for whom the past they imagined their their own presentist relationship with the past in different ways. Um, it seems to me. I want you to. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, you came down at the end at leaving the past as a foreign country in a way, that it has value there in its alienness. Um, and that it's through that attempting to maybe do the impossible act of bridging our relationship with the past that we actually get somewhere and become more human as a consequence. So A, I wanna ask you if I got that right. And B, I wanna ask you about specifically the act of reading. As an archaeologist, um, we have a different engagement with that untouchable past, right? Um, which is about trying to touch actual people's lives, which is a different and less guided act than the act of reading. Mm -hmm. We don't have people to help guide us, right? Um, it, there's a huge, there's a huge lacuna. So I also want to hear your thoughts on those sets of relationships that are material rather than textual. Ah, that's that, that's a great question, and and one I I have to say from the start, you're probably going to be better placed to comment on than I because I'm looking at at archaeology and the work of, of an archaeologist from such a distance. But um, but first, but I'm also glad you get give me a chance first of all to clarify. Yes, that was the arc you described that accurately um, of my argument, and and also to clarify that when I think about text, and I said this at the very beginning of the first lecture. I am thinking about all these texts. So you are also right to consider, I'm not just thinking about the literary text when I talk about the act of reading, but, but multiple, including material artifacts. But yeah, the relationship is, is absolutely different. Uh, and I think the, um, in, I mean, this is, this is really why after a good deal of time thinking through um, what turned out to be a thought experiment, but I thought might be my argument for all of you now, but wasn't, that, a, that in terms of thinking about a global ancient studies, what we should really aim for is a global literary studies. I was reading, I mentioned Sheldon Pollock 
um, who's written a good deal about what he calls, and he edited a collection called World Philology. And I'm partly because I'm, I'm so desperately worried about the study of, of, of written texts as well as, but, but especially written texts at a time when, and spoken texts, um, oratory as well, at a time when, uh, when the meaning of words, we talked a little bit about this last week, you know, it is so, it's so crucially important to keep having deep and rich and self-critical conversations about what texts mean and the devaluing and decentering of that study in you know the late 20th and early 21st century uh, for early 21st century university uh, is is it's been such a dramatic shift and and I really I feel that sense of loss and worry about it because the skill is so needed so that that was what led me down the path kind of a year or so ago a year and a half ago of thinking, you know, what would it look like to, to jump on the world philology train effectively and say, you know, this is really the way. But what pulled me away from that in the end, and I even tried this argument out with some colleagues at the University of Victoria about six weeks ago, and I was like, what about this? And, and they've hated it for other reasons, but, <laughs> um, but, but what pulled me back from that was precisely the, um, the power of the, the, that early German 19th century fantasy that has paid off and continues to pay off. Not that we live up to it all the time. There's a certain fantasy of the rich interdisciplinary uh, exchange of classical studies departments that I hear all the time. People say, that's just a myth. I mean, I never talk to my archeology span colleagues. I never, I never even talk to my history colleagues. If I study philosophy or literature, I only talk, you know, I go to complete talks. I don't, so I don't want to again, you know, be too rosy tinted in my in my um, in my in, in my conclusions about this. But but there is something I think in the thinking through uh, of the full lived reality, conceptual, intellectual, and finally getting your question material, and that the lived experience that can check literary scholars in some fantasies about what they think their texts mean can remind literary scholars or, or philosophers uh, of lived realities in ways that are crucially important to anchor our thinking. Uh, and then I hope vice versa, you know, providing insights or ideas that guide, you know, how you're doing your work of imagination. But it's that collective imagination um, in, the, uh, in the very short section I, I had, you know, and what I had time to talk with you today about about Novalis and Hoffman and the growth of fantasy um, and fairy tale in this time, uh, I think that's a side of the emergence of, of, the, of the German philology that needs a lot more attention because it is all about that. I mean, the people who read Tolkien's appendices, you know, and find in his arcane memories of, I, I won't reveal my geeky underside, right? And, and how much I remember about this from when I was a kid, but, it's that kind of full immersion that only the interaction between people who are reading literary texts and reading material texts, so to speak, um, can provide. I hope that gets at some of what you were. Yes, thank you. Other questions, please. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. And I also really appreciated the many references to my fellow German classicists. And it made me um, kind of reflect on um, the way that I first learned to read text when I was in my undergraduate degree in Germany. And what I'm actually trying to um, ask you about is um, the act of reading and the big kingdom of the classicists that is attached to the literary study of antiquity, which is the canon. And from what you've been talking about, it seems to me that if we reinvent the classics in a way that is productive towards a more inclusive study of the field, then we also have to reinvent our canon. And um, I'm just really wondering if you could talk about how you would imagine that, because it seems that the canon definitely has to expand in some ways, which makes it even more difficult to study um, like the ancient worlds because it gets more vast. But at the same time, from what you were saying, it also seems that we don't only have to learn more about what we are reading, but also how we are reading. So I'm just curious if you could talk about that. 
Yes, yeah, that's and it, it, it's a terrific question. I mean, the and and yes, it definitely means a lot more work to do. Um, and uh, and and I've never thought of actually doing this until this moment, but I'm now curious to go back to you know a couple of journals uh, like the Transactions of the American Philological Association or uh, Classical Philology or American Journal of Philology, you name it, um, and study and, and do a survey of topics because you would see, I think, what you're saying about the canon amplified you know, to a great degree there with lots and lots of articles on, on a very small number of authors. I mean, even smaller than the ones we teach in a doctoral curriculum. Uh, one of the most exciting, uh, you know, in, in my mind, as I think about the implications of, of creating um, world studies um, is putting traditions in, in, in conversation with each other, not just in their antiquities, you know, call it um, the Han Empire in China and, you know, and the Roman Empire um, around the turn of the millennium, but also in the study of reception. So as my, and, and now I get a, a, a chance to signal uh, I am genuinely excited about the growth of reception studies in classical studies as it now exists. I am really worried about its being its only future as I hope came across, but that's happening, reception studies across ancient studies. It's not just in you know, Greek and Roman, uh, classical, um, ancient Near Eastern, um, it's actually not happening in Eastern, ancient Near Eastern studies so much, but it's, it's, it's happening in a, a number of ancient studies. And, it's in that conversation that I really see the, um, the excitement of, of the kind of, and not just the excitement, the ethical value and political value of, of conversations that put people in different regions of the world who are thinking about their past and their investments in their past and what they believe their you know, heritage concepts are and, and get those conversations going so that we better understand how people in the Middle East, um, how people in North America, how people in Latin America, you know, are, are setting up their own ethical and political investments in their own pasts. It, for that conversation to happen within a particular tradition is fine. I mean, that, that's, that's a good. Even better though, is especially as, as I talked about last week in a, in a world where you know, conflict and division by region and by language is so intense and hot to set those traditions in conversation. So, the, so to finally just get to your expansion of the canon question, one of the biggest, like most frustrating questions I think about our field as we currently define it is the arbitrary cutoff. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I know people transgress these borders all the time and I hear exciting, um, exciting news of, of dissertations on the, the age of Charlemagne and what have you, but uh, but the fact of the matter is, and and, and you know the, the kind of magnetic pull is not just Greece and Rome, but it's these centuries from the fifth century to you know the, the fifth century BC to the second century CE, and the vitality of you know especially Latin. I'll just take actually I won't say especially. I'll just take what I know a little bit about the Latin text being written you know through the through the eighteenth century is, um, as I say, it's a frustrating mystery to me why, it's, why that remains so understudied, so vastly understudied, um, when the skills and um, kind of worldviews that I was trying to tease out today are, are key to understanding them. So, so yes to expansion and yes to more work, but also yes to more collaboration, so we're not trying to do it all ourselves, and, um, and, and yes to that big vision. Thank you. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, I had a sort of a follow-up question um, on like the, the risk of expanding um, and how you kind of would prevent a similar scenario to where we are now just arising again in the future. And I'm thinking a bit about the idea of sort of, it seems to me that you're arguing for creating a more holistic humanistic approach to the past um, and it's hard not to feel like there's the risk that a sort of a similar humanism occurred a long time ago and gradually became more specialized, but it began with this sort of very all encompassing um, approach where you'd have people that could do all sorts of things, but then they sort of had their preferences and pursued those. Um, and I could see that 
in 200 years time, this new sort of global ancient studies has sort of re-departmentalized as people sort of find their preferences and through the necessities of teaching various expertise. Um, so I'm intrigued to hear how you think we might be able to prevent that cycle just recurring ad infinitum and whether you think that encouraging sort of a comfort with ignorance or displeasure in your studies might be the key hmm. to something like that. That's a great way to put it. Uh, th there would definitely be, be danger and, and uh, a careful, I mean, not just a careful eye, but great care would have to be put into practice, you know, to, to, to ward off the development you're, you're describing. And, and that would be, you know, the big obstacle from the very beginning, I think, to, to ha imagine how this could possibly work. But the, well, first, I've said enough about the payoff. Um, I don't need to say that again. I think the, the uh, one of the pieces of the payoff that we would see soon, immediately, really, and we can actually see it when we do cross, um, we do a workshop or we do a seminar, or we find ourselves in a conversation where we're having these comparative uh, cross-cultural conversations is in the new questions they open up. So here's where I, you know, as I said in the end, we don't know what it would look like and it, it might be a Tower of Babel, but, uh, but it would be new material and it would open up, I think, questions of, of, that would kind of redound back on us, on our familiar approach to concepts and our comfort with certain approaches like you know, studying certain genres or investigating the history of certain concepts like justice and, and so on and so forth. I think the, 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 I've had enough experiences of these cross-cultural conversations that were you know, trans-regional that really upend concepts in the conversation and make it very difficult to go back to what one thought before. So that, that I think that will be one kind of intellectual check against um, against the, the, the kind of falling out you're describing. Um, kind of two more, more quickly. I mean, one is that the study of ancient languages and all the techniques of epigriography, epigri epigri a new field. <laughs> <laughs> I'm introducing not one, but new field of study, it turns out tonight. So epigriography, um, epigraphy and paleography and, and the skills of, of preserving and interpreting, you know, the, the real technical skills they, uh, I, mean, I, I feel like I can't convey strongly enough as worried as I am about literary interpretation, how really worried I am about these skills and their perpetuation. And yet, you know, we have a lot of work to do in designing an education that doesn't seek to teach them to everyone because not every undergraduate or even graduate student will wanna learn them. But I don't see a way forward to preserve um, that kind of knowledge without creating alliances with other people and other traditions who, who and that will be another um, bul bulwark in a way against the kind of um, devolution you're describing. And then lastly, the, um, the I, I said a little bit about this last Thursday, the, the deep popular interest, and I had a not very successful joking reference to the, to the, the movie um, that Matt Damon was in that I still haven't looked up, um, that is put, kind of inserts Matt Damon into a piece of Asian history. That kind of cross-cultural matchup um, will be, I think, another bulwark because this is really the world in which we're living anyway. Uh, so our task, I think, would be to try to tie interest in understanding well, just interest and pleasure in, and also interest in understanding that kind of text, if you want to call that movie a text, then I would, with, you know, with the kinds of finer grain, say, skills and knowledges, tradition by tradition, that we will need to preserve. I hope that gets at your question a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions from Zoom. Uh, the first one, it's kind of a a more logistical follow-up on, on the question of a um, holistic uh, approach. So it's an apologetic, very um, practical, boring, administrative question. Our questioner asks, uh, um, points out that classics departments are already spread pretty thin as it is uh, across universities and colleges. And ancient global studies department, if that's roughly 
what you are describing. It sounds like an even larger set of scholars would be necessary to, sufficient, to be su sufficiently holistic. Um, so as an administrator, how do you imagine this would be done well? Um, and the question is thinking here, uh, both for faculty and for training students, uh, rather than an institutional overhaul, are you suggesting uh, encouraging maybe more interdisciplinary work across existing structures? Yes, absolutely, to the, to the last one. But, but here, going back to this question of coverage, uh, and, and, and that's a really good question. Here we have really two centuries of, of, attem of, of attempts and failures you know, to cope with this. The, the so I'm, so I'm so glad this questioner asked this question to try to be a little bit clearer on this. The intellectual fantasy and the epistemological underpinnings that, that, and, and the hermeneutic work that goes into making a case for why and how we can seek to immerse ourselves and kind of fully understand understanding of course this is a it's a it's a fantasy it's never going to be you know fully achieved as a as an aspiration and as a hermeneutic frame this i find you know just i i and i think i'm not alone because of fan culture in in all its iter it's in, in all its expressions i think this remains profoundly compelling but it's not a guideline for hiring in a department and why it was ever conceived of as being that way is a question we could ask ourselves. I mean, I think we're, we're looking at a landscape in the early 19th century, and then when it, you know, when university organization, you know, essentially German university organization makes the leap, you know, across the ocean and, and comes to the United States, we're talking about, you know, competitive faculties, people who are um, seeking to build kind of small empires who are looking for what justification they can make to creating departments that had quote unquote, quote unquote coverage and needed large numbers of people. That um, mutatis mutandis, I'm, I'm fine with making the case for numbers if we're talking about pulling together scholars of ancient studies from multiple regions around the world and collecting them in, in a group. But one piece of the fantasy again that I would let go of is the fantasy that a single group of people in a single tradition can possibly hope to cover, and it, to use that word again, um, the field. Uh, and much better to just given, and again, now you know, thinking 200 years later, given our so much easier access to knowledge, given the traveling of scholars, you know, given access to scholars and scholarship, uh, that fantasy, that piece of it seems thoroughly outdated and we should just give it a rest. I mean, I think we should, we could hire a global, uh, make up a global ancient studies uh, program that you know had a dozen people in it with varying expertise in material culture, literary culture from around the regions of the world, and and really get people who worked together, who shared the vision, who had pedagogical you know interests in common, who talked together, who worked together well, um, and who do excellent work, and leave it at that. You know the coverage issue within traditions. Uh, I, I think is uh, it, it's it's just not needed in the way that I suspect it felt was needed 200 years ago with the limits of travel and technology. Yeah, thank you. And the other line of questioning, if I can just uh, summarize it, concerns classics um, outside of academia or as it's understood or perceived or exists outside of academia. And you've touched on this already, uh, including in the first lecture. But um, one questioner asks, basically, how does this project interact with that world of classics outside of academia? And another questioner points to their own gateway to classics through things like Percy Jackson and um, popular cultural representations of classics that were a pathway into what is now an academic interest for that person, uh, but yeah. And the, and the power of that in pulling them in. Yes, and yeah. so, so, you know, um, what role does the mainstream play in inspiring the scholarly expansion you describe? Yeah, that's a, I, I think that question, the second question in terms of in pop culture and representations of ancient culture, it, it, that is solving itself, you know, as more and more uh, group, you know, members of different groups 
and I'm now just thinking about our context where we are in North America, um, are feeling empowered and finding an audience in writing about multiple ancient traditions. So I think that that, um, I look ahead um, and I hope this, this responds to the, to the questioner's concerns. I look ahead with a, a lot of confidence to a world that's actually already out there where there are more and more opportunities for people to find their way in through to, to the study of antiquity kind of globally conceived through many, many different cultures. So there's, there are, you know, there are films and, um, and cartoons and, and novels that, you know, still not enough, I would say, uh, at, by any means in, in the global South for sure, but certainly with, uh, with in, in ancient China and ancient India that are offering the same paths in. They don't, um, they don't, have to follow right the same trajectory all the way through, if you see what I mean. I mentioned Tolkien and my geeky interest in him uh, a few minutes ago, but I wasn't kidding. I mean, I suspect I'm not alone in the room to have as a child fallen in love with that fantasy world and found in its kind of um, quasi scholarly self presentation in the footnotes and the addenda and the endless you know publications of ever more notebooks and material. Uh, a way into getting, you know, falling in love with a different antiquity. Uh, and that antiquity, I mean, in, in a way, to put what I mean kind of concisely, <laughs> to try to do that, to create, to, to live in a world where it, one can veer from one to the other, you know, and fall in love with ancient China, but then end up studying, you know, ancient South America as a graduate student or, or vice versa. Um, it seems like the plurality of, I mean, I, so I share the questioner's concern about the, and, and um, speaking to the power of that poll and make a pitch for the plural paths uh, for which that poll to be exercised, could be exercised. There was, but the first question, sorry, I, now I, I was thinking about popular culture and yeah, I lost the first. The first question just concerned how you would understand this sort of new approach to doing classical studies interacts with classics outside of academia so it interacts with or you know what what interaction could you understand yeah this is i mean if i i um i look around at you know efforts say to teach latin and greek you know at, like in, in grammar schools and, and to bolster the teaching of latin and greek in grammar schools and 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 i applaud the, those efforts uh I, I think they would be stronger if they worked with allies. You know, if, if there were um, not the, the preoccupation with languages and traditions that particularly right now, I mean, I wanna be honest, are, they're hard to defend kind of standing on their own because they do signal even for people who, um, who have deep and profound critiques of Eurocentri Eurocentrism and don't want any kind of association and have no association with powers advocating for white supremacy. And yet, you know, because of the story I told last week, you know, that this is part of our history and we have to confront that entanglement, which is one of the reasons I think, along with sheer intellectual interest and just as the Afrofuturist I quoted said, you know, more joy around the table, you know, the, to bring in, um, and, and, and advocate alongside those parents and those teachers and those public advocates um, in public and private schools, pushing for study of Hebrew, study of Chinese, study of Arabic, um, study of the ancient worlds or you know, antiquities generally, that I think would strengthen, strengthen the bid. Thanks, Joe. That was um, super thought provoking. And um, as I was sort of tracking your responses to the last sort of three or four or five questions about, um, you know, an expansive vision and allies and collaborations and partnerships and this sort of the, the sense of um, comfort with displeasure, I think, as, as it was put, um, it prompted me to wonder about about the next step, right? I, I, I suppose, you know, this is sort of, as is so often the case, this is sort of my own stuff that I'm reading, right? But um, 
does this stop at the humanities? And um, if, as I assume you're gonna say no, um, then what, is, what does that look like, right? We talk about interdisciplinarity a lot and we're all very sort of excited about it and we try to do it. Um, but how, how, do, how do we do that? And what does that allyship, allyship collaboration look like? That, yeah, a great question. And you were right in guessing um, no. Um, the, um, I talked a little bit about this last, last night with some humanists, um, faculty in the humanities about the, and I think I mentioned the, um, the two cultures, the, the CP Snow two cultures and how, you know, if anything, has taught us how limiting that paradigm is. It's the last couple of years of living in conditions of pandemic where we all had to confront the fact that in order to convince people to get vaccinated, you know, scientific knowledge and argument was insufficient for many people. Um, and, and, and that the bifurcation of knowledges literally kills. So, uh, so it, easy to say though, right? I mean, conceptually, and, and so the, I can offer kind of two thoughts about this, and and but but it, this really is the slow and hard boring of hard boards. Uh, that as, as again, to use a phrase I've used before, the that Weber calls politics, and it happens has to happen both in the committee room, department by department, and with leadership from the top, which has to be enrolled from the start. But my but two thoughts, um, and with all respect and and maybe apologies to any social scientists in the room. Um, as a humanist and, and as Dean for Humanities, I always found more allies in the sciences than I did in the social sciences. And one of the, um, and, and you know, we don't have time to speculate on reasons why, but some of the, the easiest collaborations happened in the marriage of history and cultural studies um, and, um, and physics or biology or chemistry. So th there's, I think, promise in say starting with, and this is gonna be my second point, the core curriculum or whatever, whatever, whatever represents the core curriculum these days or, or general education requirements or freshman experience, or there's always something around which faculty can be brought to talk about, to, uh, about the core of a liberal arts education. And that can be a really effective lever. Um, I'll just add that um, I'm impressed, uh, although I have a different vision of the canon than um, than the Teagle Foundation has. But the Teagle Foundation has been doing really interesting work in bolstering core curricula um, at, um, at a couple of universities around the country. And one of the things they're finding is that students do respond really well to a powerfully articulated, like reason to be here core curriculum. Um, so that's a, I'd say this not just as an ex-director of a core curriculum, but, um, but as someone who's seen how effective that can be as a real concrete first step long way away from shifting department names and departmental. I mean, I'm not under any illusion that that, that, that all happens like a you know, fall of dominoes, but, um, but for a concrete next step, that's one thing. And starting with the scientists. Um, maybe the end of what we can ask of Joy without her collapsing. Um, and I think it was Ralph actually who had, that, had his hand up for a while, but do you want to seed your I question? <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> I leave it to. Well, I know. <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, Come on, Ralph. Here. <laughs> is, is it really? Is there anyone else? Okay. Um, was there? I think there was, was someone there in someone? the back, actually. Yeah. Oh, ah. Well, I'm going to just do the same thing as Ralph did. <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. It's only the, the engineering we're talking about would happen so easily, right? Go ahead. Well, this has now become quite a singular honor, so thank you all. <laughs> um, I hope I can live up to the pressure. Um, yeah, on the point about disciplinary and departmental boundaries, I think it's easy for us all to uh, take as our frame of reference with good reason um, institutions uh, that we're most familiar with, R1 institutions, where you know we're lucky enough to have many different departments that are more or less distinctly uh, defined, where we could envision you know more collaboration um, and and uh, cross discussion and so on. 
I'm curious if we put, say, uh, you know, some of these ideas about breaking down those boundaries and or reshaping them, how that might uh, intersect with, uh, I don't know, what we could call well, the crisis of the humanities or the contraction of humanities. And I'm thinking of especially smaller institutions where um, sort of for, uh, you know, maybe not the best reasons through this contraction, um, you know, people from formerly different departments have been sort of all thrown together under one heading. And those are also, you know, smaller groups of people with obviously, uh, you know, no claim to having a, you know, holistic, complete uh, representation of a whole field of study. But I'm curious if you see these, you know, maybe as, as a silver lining to what is maybe its own problem that we should be trying to address um, in, you know, trying to promote reinvestment in the humanities and, you know, regrowing uh, areas in which maybe it's contracted if institutions that have uh, struggled with those kinds of circumstances uh, may actually be uh, in a position to lead or uh, almost as laboratories for uh, developing this kind of collaboration uh, at all levels. You, you put it perfectly just then, honestly. Um, and, and as I, I said a little bit um, last week, I should stop saying that, but I just want to acknowledge I'm, I'm not unaware that I'm repeating a little bit. Um, but my, uh, my thinking here is, you know, relies really heavily on conversations I've had um, with many faculty um, and not graduate students typically because they're, you know, they, these aren't PhD granting departments, but with faculty in, um, in state universities, typically not flagship universities, you know, regional comprehensive universities and the like, where um, this has happened and where some surprisingly positive results. And I say surprising because you're absolutely right. These kinds of collapses of world literatures, world cultures, humanities departments, liberal arts departments. Um, I visited a university not long ago actually where there, is, there, were, there were all these things in the same school. Um, all these all these departments, including humanities and liberal arts, and I, um, I, I had to ask what the difference was between the two. Um, and because the liberal arts didn't include the sciences in, in this particular uh, in this particular university. But as you say, they've happened typically for difficult reasons um, and not with the time opportunity and almost never the prompting of intellectual um, intellectual discussion, academic discussion. Does that mean, you know, I, I, you use the phrase silver, silver lining. I mean, yes, silver lining. This is the reality though, that more and more PhDs are finding themselves um, per, perhaps having imagined a life in the R1 or, you know, in a, a highly selective liberal arts college, finding themselves in places that have departments that are these larger conglomerates. I would love to see an edu a doctoral education that prepared people better for those mm -hmm. jobs and actually taught people to, you know, to, to exult in them because people do um, once they're in them, you know, with it, it, now again, I don't want to be um, sound like I'm patronizingly saying, you know, with rosy tinted glasses, having spent most of my career in better funded places, you know, what, how great that is. I know those, you know, I understand, have seen those challenges um, firsthand and, and they are real, but Yes, I think you, you are right on target that learning from people um, like Evan Jewell has been writing about this, uh, about being an ancient historian, not in the classics department. He's not alone. Um, people who, who know how to make this work for themselves and are finding those new conversations, exciting conversations, really galvanizing and, and you know, career driving. So, um, so yeah, this would be a nice, a nice, um, turn of, 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 you know, the arc or a step on the arc of justice, if it turned out that um, these, you know, challenged universities where faculty life, you know, is hemmed in by lack of resources and, and lack of funding could turn out to lead the world. <laughs> Thanks. That seems like a great place to end. Um, I think though, for more solutions to all of these questions, tune in on Thursday. <laughs> where more solutions, I think, will be forthcoming. So yeah. can we please just thank Joy one more time? Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all again on Thursday. Yeah, excellent. Same time, same bat channel. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you.